You are listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. The Ballad of the White Horse This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joshua Christensen, July 2007. The Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton Prefatory Note and Dedication Prefatory Note to the First Edition This ballad needs no historical notes for the simple reason that it does not profess to be historical. All of it that is not frankly fictitious, as in any prose romance about the past, is meant to emphasize tradition rather than history. King Alfred is not a legend in the sense that King Arthur may be a legend, that is, in the sense that he may possibly be a lie. But King Alfred is a legend in this broader and more human sense, that the legends are the most important things about him. The cult of Alfred was a popular cult, from the darkness of the ninth century to the deepening twilight of the twentieth. It is wholly as a popular legend that I deal with him here. I write as one ignorant of everything, except that I have found the legend of a king of Wessex still alive in the land. I will give three curt cases of what I mean. A tradition connects the ultimate victory of Alfred with the valley in Berkshire called the Vale of the White Horse. I have seen doubts of the tradition, which may be valid doubts. I do not know when or where the story started. It is enough that it started somewhere and ended with me, for I only seek to write upon a hearsay, as the old balladists did. For the second case, there is a popular tale that Alfred played the harp and sang in the Danish camp. I select it because it is a popular tale, at whatever time it arose. For the third case, there is a popular tale that Alfred came in contact with a woman and cakes. I select it because it is a popular tale, because it is a vulgar one. It has been disputed by grave historians, who were, I think, a little too grave to be good judges of it. The two chief charges against the story are that it was first recorded long after Alfred's death, and that, as Mr. Oman urges, Alfred never really wandered all alone without any thanes or soldiers. Both these objections might possibly be met. It has taken us nearly as long to learn the whole truth about Byron, and perhaps longer to learn the whole truth about Pepys, than elapsed between Alfred and the first writing of such tales. As for the other objection, do the historians really think that Alfred after Wilton, or Napoleon after Leipzig, never walked about in a wood by himself for the matter of an hour or two? Ten minutes might be made sufficient for the essence of the story. But I am not concerned to prove the truth of these popular traditions. It is enough for me to maintain two things, that they are popular traditions, and that without these popular traditions we should have bothered about Alfred about as much as we bother about Edwig. One other consideration needs a note. Alfred has come down to us in the best way, that is by national legends, solely for the same reason as Arthur and Roland and the other giants of that darkness, because he fought for the Christian civilization against the heathen nihilism. But since this work was really done by generation after generation, by the Romans before they withdrew, and by the Britons while they remained, I have summarized this first crusade in a triple symbol, and given to a fictitious Roman, Celt, and Saxon a part in the glory of Ethandun. I fancy that in fact Alfred's Wessex was of very mixed bloods, but in any case it is the chief value of legend to mix up the centuries while preserving the sentiment, to see all ages in a sort of splendid foreshortening. That is the use of tradition. It telescopes history. G. K. C. End of Prefatory Note Dedication To My Wife Of great limbs gone to chaos, A great face turned to night, Why bend above a shapeless shroud, Seeking in such archaic cloud Sight of strong lords and light? Where seven sunken Englands lie buried one by one, why should one idle spade, I wonder, shake up the dust of thanes like thunder 
to smoke and choke the sun. In cloud of clay so cast to heaven, what shape shall man discern? These lords may light the mystery of mastery or victory, and these ride high in history, but these shall not return. Gored on the Norman gonfalon, the golden dragon died. We shall not wake with ballad strings the good time of the smaller things. We shall not see the holy kings ride down by Severn's side. Stiff, strange, and quaintly colored as the broidery of Bayou, the England of that dawn remains, and this of Alfred and the Danes seems like the tales a whole tribe feigns too English to be true. Of a good king on an island that ruled once on a time, and as he walked by an apple tree, there came green devils out of the sea, with sea plants trailing heavily, and tracks of opal slime. Yet Alfred is no fairy tale. His days as our days ran. He also looked forth for an hour on peopled plains and skies that lower from those few windows in the tower that is the head of a man. But who shall look from Alfred's hood or breathe his breath alive? His century, like a small dark cloud, drifts far. It is an eyeless crowd, where the tortured trumpets scream aloud, and the dense arrows drive. Lady, by one light only, we look from Alfred's eyes. We know he saw athwart the wreck, the sign that hangs about your neck, where one more than Melchizedek is dead and never dies. Therefore I bring these rhymes to you, who brought the cross to me, since on you flaming without flaw I saw the sign that Guthrum saw, when he let break his ships of awe and laid peace on the sea. Do you remember when we went under a dragon moon, and mid volcanic tints of night walked where they fought the unknown fight, and saw black trees on the battle height, black thorn on Ethandun? And I thought, I will go with you, as man with God has gone, and wander with a wandering star, the wandering heart of things that are, the fiery cross of love and war that, like yourself, goes on. O oh, go you onward, where you are shall honour and laughter be, past purpled forest and pearled foam, God's winged pavilion free to roam, your face that is a wandering home, a flying home for me. Ride through the silent earthquake lands, wide as a waste is wide, across these days like deserts when pride and a little scratching pen have dried and split the hearts of men, heart of the heroes ride. Up through an empty house of stars, being what heart you are, up the inhuman steeps of space, as on a staircase go in grace, carrying the firelight on your face beyond the loneliest star. Take these, in memory of the hour we strayed a space from home, and saw the smoke-hued hamlets quaint with westland king and westland saint, and watched the western glory faint along the road to Frome. G. K. C. End of Dedication This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. The Ballad of the White Horse, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joshua Christensen, August 2007. The Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton. Book One The Vision of the King. Before the gods that made the gods had seen their sunrise pass, the white horse of the white horse vale was cut out of the grass. Before the gods that made the gods had drunk at dawn their fill, the white horse of the white horse vale was hoary on the hill. Age beyond age on British lands, eons on eons gone, was peace and war in western hills, and the white horse looked on. For the white horse knew England, 
when there was none to know he saw the first oar break or bend he saw heaven fall and the world end o oh god how long ago for the end of the world was long ago and all we dwell to-day as children of some second birth like a strange people left on earth after a judgment day for the end of the world was long ago when the ends of the world waxed free when rome was sunk in a waste of slaves and the sun drowned in the sea when caesar's sun fell out of the sky and whoso hearkened right could only hear the plunging of the nations in the night when the ends of the earth came marching in to torch and cresset gleam and the roads of the world that lead to rome were filled with faces that moved like foam like faces in a dream and men rode out of the eastern lands broad river and burning plain trees that are titan flowers to see and tiger skies striped horribly with tints of tropic rain where inns enamelled peaks arise around that inmost one where ancient eagles on its brink vast as archangels gather and drink the sacraments of the sun and men break out of the northern lands enormous lands alone where a spell is laid upon life and lust and the rain is changed to a silver dust and the sea to a great green stone and a shape that moveth murkily in mirrors of ice and night hath blanched with fear all beasts and birds as death and a shock of evil words blast a man's hair with white and the cry of the palms and the purple moons or the cry of the frost and foam swept ever around an inmost place and the din of distant race on race cried and replied round rome and there was death on the emperor and night upon the pope and alfred hiding in deep grass hardened his heart with hope a sea-folk blinder than the sea broke all about his land but alfred up against them bare and gripped the ground and grasped the air staggered and strove to stand he bent them back with spear and spade with desperate dyke and wall with foemen leaning on his shield and roaring on him when he reeled and no help came at all he broke them with a broken sword a little towards the sea and for one hour of panting peace ringed with a roar that would not cease with golden crown and girded fleece made laws under a tree the northmen came about our land a christless chivalry who knew not of the arch or pen great beautiful half-witted men from the sunrise and the sea misshapen ships stood on the deep full of strange gold and fire and hairy men as huge as sin with horned heads came wading in through the long low sea mire our towns were shaken of tall kings with scarlet beards like blood the world turned empty where they trod they took the kindly cross of god and cut it up for wood their souls were drifting as the sea and all good towns and lands they only saw with heavy eyes and broke with heavy hands their gods were sadder than the sea gods of a wandering will who cried for blood like beasts at night sadly from hill to hill they seemed as trees walking the earth as witless and as tall yet they took hold upon the heavens and no help came at all they bred like birds in english woods they rooted like the rose when alfred came to athelney to hide him from their bows there was not english armour left nor any english thing when alfred came to athelney to be an english king for earthquake swallowing earthquake uprent the wessex tree the whirlpool of the pagan sway had swirled his sires as sticks away when a flood smites the sea and the great kings of wessex wearied and sank in gore and even their ghosts in that great stress grew greyer and greyer less and less with the lords that died in lioness and the king that comes no more and the god of the golden dragon was dumb upon his throne and the lord of the golden dragon ran in the woods alone and if ever he climbed the crest of luck and set the flag before 
returning as a wheel returns came ruin and the rain that burns and all began once more and naught was left king alfred but shameful tears of rage in the island in the river in the end of all his age in the island in the river he was broken to his knee and he read writ with an iron pen that god had wearied of wessex men and given their country field and fen to the devils of the sea and he saw in a tiny picture tiny and far away his mother sitting in egbert's hall and a book she showed him very small where a sapphire mary sat in stall with a golden christ at play it was wrought in the monk's slow manner from silver and sanguine shell where the scenes are little and terrible keyholes of heaven and hell in the river island of athelney with the river running past in colours of such simple creed all things sprang at him sun and weed till the grass grew to be grass indeed and the tree was a tree at last fearfully plain the flowers grew like the child's book to read or like a friend's face seen in a glass he looked and there our lady was she stood and stroked the tall live grass as a man strokes his steed her face was like an open word when brave men speak and choose the very colours of her coat were better than good news she spoke not nor turned not nor any sign she cast only she stood up straight and free between the flowers in athelney and the river running past one dim ancestral jewel hung on his ruined armour grey he rent and cast it at her feet where after centuries with slow feet men came from hall and school and street and found it where it lay mother of god the wanderer said i am but a common king nor will i ask what saints may ask to see a secret thing the gates of heaven are fearful gates worse than the gates of hell nor would i break the splendours barred or seek to know the things they guard which is too good to tell but for this earth most pitiful this little land i know if that which is for ever is or if our hearts should break with bliss seeing the stranger go when our last bow is broken queen and our last javelin cast under some sad green evening sky holding a ruined cross on high under warm westland grass to lie shall we come home at last and a voice came human but high up like a cottage climbed among the clouds or a surf of hut and croft that sits by his hovel fire as oft but hears on his old bare roof aloft a belfry burst in song the gates of heaven are lightly locked we do not guard our gain the heaviest hind may easily come silently and suddenly upon me in a lane and any little maid that walks in good thoughts apart may break the guard of the three kings and see the dear and dreadful things i hid within my heart the meanest man in grey fields gone behind the set of sun heareth between star and other star through the door of the darkness fallen ajar the counsel eldest of things that are the talk of the three in one the gates of heaven are lightly locked we do not guard our gold men may uproot where worlds begin or read the name of the nameless sin but if he fail or if he win to no good man is told the men of the east may spell the stars and times and triumphs mark but the men signed of the cross of christ go gaily in the dark the men of the east may search the scrolls for sure fates and fame but the men that drink the blood of god go singing to their shame the wise men know what wicked things are written on the sky they trim sad lamps they touch sad strings hearing the heavy purple wings where the forgotten seraph kings still plot how god shall die the wise men know all evil things under the twisted trees where the perverse in pleasure pine and men are weary of green wine and sick of crimson seas but you and all the kind of christ are ignorant and brave and you have wars you hardly win and souls you hardly save i tell you not for your comfort yea not for your desire 
save that the sky grows darker yet, and the sea rises higher. Night shall be thrice night over you, and heaven an iron cope. Do you have joy without a cause? Yea, faith without hope? Even as she spoke she was not, nor any word said he. He only heard, still as he stood, under the old knight's nodding hood, the sea-folk breaking down the wood, like a high tide from sea. He only heard the heathen men, whose eyes are blue and bleak, singing about some cruel thing, done by a great and smiling king in daylight on a deck. He only heard the heathen men, whose eyes are blue and blind, singing what shameful things are done, between the sunlit sea and the sun, when the land is left behind. End of Book One The Ballad of the White Horse Book Two This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joshua Christensen, August 2007. The Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton. Book Two, The Gathering of the Chiefs. Up across windy wastes and up went Alfred over the shaws, shaken of the joy of giants, the joy without a cause. In the slopes away to the western bays, where blows not ever a tree, he washed his soul in the west wind, and his body in the sea. And he set to rhyme his ale measures, and he sang aloud his laws, because of the joy of the giants, the joy without a cause. For the king went gathering Wessex men as grain out of the chaff, the few that were alive to die, laughing as littered skulls that lie, after lost battles turned to the sky an everlasting laugh. The king went gathering Christian men as wheat out of the husk, Eldred, the Franklin by the sea, and Mark, the man from Italy, and Colen of the sacred tree from the old tribe on Usk. The rook croaked homeward heavily, the west was clear and warm, the smoke of evening food and ease rose like a blue tree in the trees when he came to Eldred's farm. But Eldred's farm was fallen awry, like an old cripple's bones, and Eldred's tools were red with rust, and on his well was a green crust, and purple thistles upward thrust between the kitchen stones. But smoke of some good feasting went upwards evermore, and Eldred's doors stood wide apart, for loitering foot or labouring cart, and Eldred's great and foolish heart stood open like his door. A mighty man was Eldred, a bulk for casks to fill, his face a dreaming furnace, his body a walking hill. In the old wars of Wessex his sword had sunken deep, but all his friends, he sighed and said, were broken about Ethelred, and between the deep drink and the dead he had fallen upon sleep. Come not to me, King Alfred, save always for the ale. Why should my harmless hinds be slain, because the chiefs cry once again, as in all fights, that we shall gain, and in all fights we fail? Your skulls still thunder and prophesy that crown that never comes. Friend, I will watch the certain things, swine and slow moons like silver rings, and the ripening of the plums. And Alfred answered, drinking, and gravely, without blame, Nor bear I boast of scald or king, the thing I bear is a lesser thing, but comes in a better name. Out of the mouth of the mother of God, more than the doors of doom, I call the muster of Wessex men, from grassy hamlet or ditch or den, to break and be broken, God knows when, but I have seen for whom. Out of the mouth of the mother of God, like a little word come I, for I go gathering Christian men, from sunken paving and ford and fen, to die in a battle God knows when, by God but I know why. And this is the word of Mary, the word of the world's desire. No more of comfort shall ye get, save that the sky grows darker yet, and the sea rises higher. 
then silence sank and slowly arose the sea-land lord like some vast beast for mystery he filled the room and porch and sky and from a cobwebbed nail on high unhooked his heavy sword up on the shrill sea-downs and up went alfred all alone turning but once ere the door was shut shouting to eldred over his butt that he bring all spears to the woodman's hut hewn under egbert's stone and he turned his back and broke the fern and fought the moths of dusk and went on his way for other friends friends fallen of all the wide world's ends from rome that wrath and pardon sends and the grey tribes on usk he saw gigantic tracks of death and many a shape of doom good steadings to grey ashes gone and a monk's house white like a skeleton in the grey crypt of the comb and in many a roman villa earth and her ivies eat saw coloured pavements sink and fade in flowers and the windy colonnade like the spectre of a street but the cold stars clustered among the cold pines ere he was half on his pilgrimage over the western lines and the white dawn widened ere he came to the last pine where mark the man from italy still made the christian sign the long farm lay on the large hillside flat like a painted plan and by the side the low white house where dwelt the southland man a bronzed man with a bird's bright eye and a strong bird's beak and brow his skin was brown like buried gold and of certain of his sires was told that they came in the shining ship of old with caesar in the prow his fruit trees stood like soldiers drilled in a straight line his strange stiff olives did not fail and all the kings of the earth drank ale but he drank wine wide over wasted british plains stood never an arch or dome only the trees to toss and reel the tribes to bicker the beasts to squeal but the eyes in his head were strong like steel and his soul remembered rome then alfred of the lonely spear lifted his lion head and fronted with the italian's eye asking him of his whence and why king alfred stood and said i am that oft defeated king whose failure fills the land who fled before the danes of old who chaffered with the danes with gold who now upon the wessex wold hardly has feet to stand but out of the mouth of the mother of god i have seen the truth like fire this that the sky grows darker yet and the sea rises higher long looked the roman on the land the trees as golden crowns blazed drenched with dawn and dew impearled while faintly are coloured freshly are curled the clouds from underneath the world stood up over the downs these vines be ropes that drag me hard he said i go not far where would you meet for you must hold half wiltshire and the white horse wold and the thames bank to owensfold if wessex goes to war guthrum sits strong on either bank and you must press his lines inwards and eastward drive him down i doubt if you shall take the crown till you have taken london town for me i have the vines if each man on the judgment day meet god on a plain alone said alfred i will speak for you as for myself and call it true that you brought all fighting folk you knew lined under egbert's stone though i be in the dust ere then i know where you will be and shouldering suddenly his spear he faded like some elfin fear where the tall pines ran up tier on tier tree over toppling tree he shouldered his spear at morning and laughed to lay it on but he leaned on his spear as on a staff with might and little mood to laugh or ever he sighted chick or calf of colan of Kerleon, for the man dwelt in a lost land of boulders and broken men in a great grey cave far off to south where a thick green forest stopped the mouth giving darkness in his den and the man was come like a shadow from the shadow of druid trees where usk with mighty murmurings past Kerleon of the fallen kings goes out to ghostly seas last of a race in ruin he spoke the speech of the gales his kin were in holy ireland or up in the crags of wales but his soul stood with his mother's folk that were of the rain-wrapped isle where patrick and brandon westerly 
looked out at last on a landless sea and the sun's last smile. His harp was carved and cunning, as the Celtic craftsman makes, graven all over with twisting shapes like many headless snakes. His harp was carved and cunning, his sword prompt and sharp, and he was gay when he held the sword, sad when he held the harp. For the great gales of Ireland are the men that God made mad, for all their wars are merry, and all their songs are sad. He kept the Roman order, he made the Christian sign, but his eyes grew often blind and bright, and the sea that rose in the rocks at night rose to his head like wine. He made the sign of the cross of God, he knew the Roman prayer, but he had unreason in his heart, because of the gods that were. Even they that walked on the high cliffs, high as the clouds were then, gods of unbearable beauty that broke the hearts of men, and whether in seat or saddle, whether with frown or smile, whether at feast or fight was he, he heard the noise of a nameless sea on an undiscovered isle. Lifting the great green ivy, and the great spear lowering, one said, I am Alfred of Wessex, and I am a conquered king. And the man of the cave made answer, and his eyes were stars of scorn, And better kings were conquered, or ever your sires were born. What goddess was your mother, what fay your breed begot, That you should not die with Uther and Arthur and Lancelot? But when you win, you brag and blow, and when you lose, you rail. Army of Eastland yokels, not strong enough to fail. I bring not boast or railing, spake Alfred, not in ire. I bring of Our Lady a lesson set. This, that our sky grows darker yet, and the sea rises higher. Then Colin of the sacred tree tossed his black mane on high, and cried as rigidly he rose, And if the sea and sky be foes, we will tame the sea and sky smiled alfred seek ye a fable more dizzy and more dread than all your mad barbarian tales where the sky stands on its head a tale where a man looks down on the sky that has long looked down on him a tale where a man can swallow a sea that might swallow the seraphim bring to the hut by egbert's stone all bills and bows ye have and alfred strode off rapidly and colan of the sacred tree went slowly to his cave End of Book Two This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com.